from the Mercy One Studio. Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulus every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Man Up. We are broadcasting from the Mercy One studio, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM, streaming around the globe online at iowacatholicradio.com. Please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on iTunes and the podcast. Uh, Go to Twitter, check us out there as well. I am Joe Stopulis. Today, I am joined again by Father P.J. McManus in the final installment of our year-long trip around the Bible through the great men of the Bible. Let's start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It has been almost exactly one year since we launched the Great Men of the Bible Timeline series with Jeff Cavins. That's actually February 4th of last year. Uh, since then, we have walked through the overview of the Bible. We've walked through the Old Testament. Obviously, Katie Patrizio launched us off uh, with the fall and why did we need, you know, what is the why? Why did any of this even need to happen? And then we just step-by-step step walk through the Bible. And I want to thank all those who joined me. We had uh, Alan Hunt, you know, Dr. Bud Marr for Abraham, D- Dr. Umberger for Isaac. Uh, Alan Hunt was on again. Dr. Peter Kraft with so many great guests uh, that joined us. Bo Bonner, as you heard last week and you heard in the Old Testament, joined us for the terrible men of the Bible because uh, that's what Bo does. Uh, P.J. Manis joined us a few times for Joshua and Samson. Obviously, he's joining us again today. Uh, Mark Hart joined us for two episodes. Katie Patrizio again joined us for Solomon. It was a wonderful blessing to have so many great guests, and I learned so much from the series. And uh, quite frankly, I'm sad to see it come to an end. Uh, today's episode on the other side of the break, Father PJ. Obviously, if you've been following, we still have a bunch of characters left, a bunch of men in the New Testament. We're going to do one final swoop, uh, walking through the New Testament, highlighting some of those those great men uh, before we close out the book on the Bible. But I just can't say enough, guys. Uh, as Catholic men today, it's our responsibility to know this stuff. Uh, we need to we need to be well-versed in the faith. We need to know our Bible. Uh, and so hopefully this series has helped you to do that uh, a little bit. Um, I, I know my, me personally, I'm going to re-listen to it, uh, start at the beginning again. I want to listen to it. Uh, a lot of those great interviews we had, because we need to know this stuff. We need to have a good idea, a good foundation of the Bible. I'm going to head to a short break. When we return... P.J. McManus. Father P.J. McManus will be with us again. Uh, Stick around. We'll be right back. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Be Not Afraid is provided by Dream Dirt Farm Real Estate and Auction. Dream Dirt's online equipment auction, Farm Bid, is an online auction house for farm machinery. We take your equipment photos and information and create listings for our customers to make it as easy as possible to get started selling machinery online. And each item is advertised individually to get the most exposure. Bidding happens 24-7 at bid.dreamdirt.com. Dream Dirt Farm and Equipment Auction Services. Farm auctions done right. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Confluence Brewing Company, brewed locally and featuring regular, seasonal, and limited-release beers available in their tap room and at local stores, bars, and restaurants. Confluence has a beer garden for you, your family, and friends to enjoy. Confluence Brewing Company is located at 1235 Thomas Beck Road off the bike trail south of Grays Lake and online at confluencebrewing.com. Confluence Brewing Company, where good things come together, ingredients, ideas, and friends. My help comes from you. You're right here pulling me through. You carry my weakness. Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulus, and today I am joined by Father PJ McManus. Welcome back, Father PJ. Thank you, Joe. He's the pastor at Christ the King in uh, the south side of Des Moines, a great man, obviously a fairly reoccurring guest now. 
on the Great Men of the Bible series, which we have come to the close of. So I needed someone who could talk about a lot of people in a short amount of time. I can think of no one better than to have you back on to do that. We can auctioneer, too, if you want. All right. So I would rather not. I think, actually, because I listen to my podcast at one and a half speed, that might throw me off if we did that. <laughs> Fair. Um, so I gave you the list of all the people we've covered already in the New Testament. We've got a lot yet to cover, but... I we got to end this thing eventually. So this is the we're coming to the tail end of the great men of the Bible series, and I thought the the best way to start is obviously let's talk about the books, and then we'll talk about the men behind the books, and we'll talk about the men in the books uh, that we haven't we haven't touched on yet. So let's start with the Gospels, mm-hmm. four Gospels, and let's talk about way back in the first episode with Jeff Cavins. Uh, it's important to understand who the audience is. Mm-hmm. It's important to understand what we're, what kind of literature we're reading. And even within the New Testament, there are different kinds of literature. Let's do kind of an overview of the four Gospels, maybe a little bit about the people, and then uh, why they were written. Okay. So so the four Gospels, uh, as we have them today, are uh, dedicated under the names of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, though most scholars believe that Mark or some version of it is probably the first that Matthew and Luke are uh, somewhat contemporary to one another and that the Gospel of St. John is written somewhat later and is a much more sort of mature reflection of the earliest church's uh, experience of the life and death of Jesus. Um, There's a lot of debate around um, authorship and uh, how many people were involved in the authorship of of the particular, uh, especially of the Gospels, because they're narrative pieces, and that's a little bit different than something like a letter, which is harder to write by committee having had to write letters by committee. Um, but uh, but I think what's significant here is that is that the church, whose ever physical pen struck the words, the early church associated these gospels with these men in particular because these men were attached to particular communities. And those communities really, really reveal um, the agenda in the best sense of, uh, of, of the authors of the gospels and what, really what the the meaning of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus had come to be for them. Okay. So when I look at that, I, and Mark being the first, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, Matthew and Luke closely thereby, I mean, it's interesting when you read about the who, why they were right. A, there's a why behind right. it, and then a B to whom. Right. Uh, and once you uncover that, you kind of understand when you read it, um, the message they're trying to get to. So let's start with Matthew. Who was he writing to and why? So Matthew was writing to um, to a group of Jewish, largely Jewish Christians, um, uh, probably within 25 to 30 years after the events which they, which they narrate. Mm-hmm. Um, he's concerned largely with making clear that Jesus exists in continuity with what has come before. So, so, so accenting continuity with the Old Testament, the promises and the prophecies being fulfilled. Um, and so he takes great pains to reference uh, the, the Hebrew scriptures a lot because um, his audience presumably is going to know them and know them by heart. Yep. So then St. Luke, well, let's just go back to St. Mark. Shortest gospel, f- first one written. Uh, was he in a hurry? Why is it so short? So there's a, there's a lot of debate about this. The traditional um, ascription here, which frankly I, I actually buy, um, not a lot of scholars do, but I do. Uh, Eusebius and other church historians identify the Mark of the gospel with John Mark, who was a companion of St. Paul, uh, who got in a fight with him, um, which shows how dysfunctional the church is right from the very beginning. Um, but that, uh, that what John Mark did basically was record the preaching of St. Peter. So that, so that what we have in the, in the gospel of Mark is a very primitive sort of unpolished account um, that was largely taken from oral traditions uh, in those in those first say fifteen years mm-hmm. of uh, of the kerygma, the early preaching, Saint Luke is a physician, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, and so a physician who also happens to write books and uh, obviously the, the account of Saint Luke, and then later on Acts as well. Right? Um, who is he writing to? So he's writing to a largely Gentile community, though there were probably Jewish converts that were embedded within it. But the the dominant community uh, that he's writing to is 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 Greek. Greek, both Greek speaking and Greek culturally. So he's more comfortable using Greek um, sort of Greek thought patterns and tropes. Um, the The language is simply better and more more fluid than in the other two. Um, and uh, and while he does reference the Hebrew scriptures, it's not with the same sort of intensity or frequency as does St. Matthew because presumably it's less important. Yeah. He also accents the, um, the sort of universal character of Jesus's uh, mission so that this isn't simply... Uh, a, a weird Jewy thing that you get attached to. Mm-hmm. And then finally, obviously 
couple decades later, St. John on the scene. Um, and it's, you know, when you're reading them straight through, there's the reason they're synoptics. I mean, they're, they sound, they feel pretty they similar to the same. Enter St. John, and it's a much different world, much more poetic. Right. Uh, who is he writing to? Why is he writing in such a style that he writes in? So there's. Uh, the Gospel of St. John is in some ways probably the most contentious with scholars today. Um, and there's a lot of thought that maybe it was written in stages, like it, like with long periods of time separating uh, the actual putting together of it. I, I think what's significant here is he's he's clearly writing in Greek and to a Greek speaking world, but with uh, but but as a person who is deeply embedded in in the Jewish world, he kind of straddles. He because this is a later document and because the tradition ascribes it to St. John, like the actual St. John, the apostle, um, this is presumably the reflections of a mature Christian. I actually preached on this last night because we had a, going well we, we had a passage from the, 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 the first the first letter of St. John, right? And, and Also, and, the final jeopardy was this last night. Was it, was it too? What are the first six words of the Gospel of John? <laughs> That's so, beautiful. There you go. Uh, did they get it? Yeah, all three. Well, it was Tournament of Champions. Got so, it. Yeah. So, of course, they, of course they got it, right? yeah. Um, the... The, I, I think the reason that the Johannine literature, the literature ascribed to St. John, so the gospel, the epistles of St. John, and then, and then Revelation, I think the reason it reads the way that it does for us is because if the tradition's right, and I think it is, about who this is and when and how he's writing, these are the first really mature reflections we have on the faith. Mm-hmm. This is the first person who's really lived with yeah. the faith his whole life long, yeah. who's who's lived the sacramental life. Like he's he's celebrated mass for yeah. probably 50 years by the time that he's writing this stuff down. And so he's lived the life and death and resurrection of the Lord so often. It's what gives meaning and purpose to his life, too. Yeah, it's kind of like with Bishop Barron talking about the doctrine. I think he got that from Henry John Henry Newman about the, the tree and the river. You know, it starts small, but it grows and doctrine can grow and, and formulate over time. You have time to think about it. So St. John had many more years to to contemplate what had happened, whereas Mark's rushing to get something out the door and get, you know, put the, put the words down in general. Um, so of the four uh, gospel writers, what can, can we... Can I, can I say something real can, quick about this that? This is your show. Well, no, you go. it's your show, Joe. But, I, but I, <laughs> I, I think to draw a parallel that maybe is a little, a little more accessible to some of our listeners, um, if you know anybody, either in your own family or like friends and coworkers, who, who are uh, relatively recent immigrants, tied to the recent immigrant experience. Every family has the story of how their people got here. And the people who actually came over had one version of the story, or, the, or if they came over and they were adults, they had one version of the story. But then the children who experienced yeah. it experienced it very differently, and their mature reflections on the same trip mm-hmm. are very, very different than their parents were. And then the grandchildren who received this story but didn't live it themselves mm-hmm. have a different version themselves. Yeah. It's still an important story. It's still their origin story, how they came to be here mm-hmm. and who they are. But 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 it sounds different, and, and and you can see meaning and value in things that you couldn't necessarily yeah. when it when it was happening. Like so so for instance, um, in my own family, one of my grandfather's uh, brothers died on the way over. Uh, got, like got knocked off the boat, um, and this and this was this was tragic, but it happened often in the in the harbor. Um, there would be a rush of the immigrants to get off the boat. No way, and people it, get, it was in the harbor. Yeah, yeah, he made it all the way across the ocean no. and then died and then died in New York Harbor. Um, and so, <laughs> and so the the I know it's like it's like Murphy's Law, right? It's a real thing for oh, Irish people. No, but the thing is, so of course, the day that this happens, right? How do you how do you balance the the heartbreak of losing a son? I'm thinking of my great grandmother here. The heartbreak of losing a son, but also the joy of finally having reached sort of this land of promise and being there with your other whatever it was four or five kids at the time. Like it's it's that dynamic, right? But then if if you would talk to my grandpa, eighty years later when I knew him, um, seventy five years later, uh. His reflections on the death of his brother and and sort of their whole beginnings in this country were very, very different than what mm-hmm. could have been told a week later mm-hmm. or a year later or five years later. Yeah. That's the kind of move that I'm that's after. That's good. No, I, I I appreciate that. And that's a crazy story about uh, about Ellis Island. All right. I mean, we, we, <laughs> we lost an extra O in our name. <laughs> that was the damage that I had at Ellis Island. Um all right, so of the four gospel writers, and obviously I think St. Matthew comes to mind just because you know the calling of St. Matthew is fairly famous. What can we learn from you, – you choose one or any of them sure. um, that you think lessons we can learn from them as men? So you know, I, I think with the call of St. Matthew, the, the, the clear lesson for me at least here is um, as the story is recounted, right, Jesus sees Matthew at his collection post and simply says – 
come follow me, and Matthew does. Now, the immediacy of the response, I think, is really interesting because most of our experience is that we sort of sit and simmer with things, and, 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 and they don't always come out of nowhere like that. Of course, we don't know what's going on with St. Matthew before. We don't know if he's miserable, if he hates his life, if he wishes he had another job, if he wishes he had a girl, all the things, right? But, but for whatever reason, when Jesus intrudes, when he inserts himself there, Matthew can recognize what's good and right and true here, and he's willing to leave everything to follow it. I think the other reason that's important is because since Matthew was a tax collector, he was still stuck in the midst of some real serious sin when the Lord intruded into his life. And he didn't wait for everything to be fixed to go and follow. Mm -hmm. He just got up and trusted that God would make him ready as he needed him to. That's very, it's perfect. Um, John, Luke, Mark, anything else from those guys? You know, guys from, you from John Mark, you know, the, the, the one real passage that we have alluding to John Mark comes from Acts, and it's because Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them, mm-hmm. and he and Paul have been fighting, and so Paul leaves him behind. Um, but, what you know, I, I think the real lesson here is that whatever was going on there, and they don't give us enough detail to really know what the fight was about, um, saints fight. Mm-hmm. And they don't always agree, even on how to run the church, which is what the fight was about. Mm-hmm. And, and But that doesn't make either of them not saints. Yeah. No. Uh, St. Luke writes Acts of the Apostles as well, uh, continuation from his gospel accounts. We we are introduced, so looking at the rest of the New Testament, so the first four books are the gospels, and then you get the rest of the New Testament, which is mostly Pauline letters. Mm-hmm. Um, a few other epistles from a, uh, a few other authors, and then finally the end, the book of Revelation. Um, but most of the narrative is going to take place here in, in the book of Acts. We're introduced to a whole slew uh, of great saints and people we can learn from. Um, St. Philip, the story of St. Philip, I just remember the first time I heard it being like, that is a really Retail cool story. Well, I just, the thing that I got away from from the story of St. Philip is, so St. Philip is, is, is he, he's walking, right? And someone's mm-hmm. uh, riding past him, and he's reading the book of Isaiah. Mm-hmm. And he says, yeah, who could possibly understand what's going on here? And Philip just is basically feels the Holy Spirit tell him, go talk to that man. Mm-hmm. Go talk to him and, and help him. And sure enough, he does it and baptizes him right there on the spot. And I just think about what the Spirit was doing. You know, mm-hmm. Obviously, the Spirit is, is loose, and, and he's, he's feeling the promptings of God. And I, I in my own life... I, I try to mimic that in some way, shape, or form, which is have that kind of spontaneity. When you feel the Lord tugging you, just answer and say yes. And it might feel stupid to go up to a guy on a horse or a camel and say, "Hey, would you? What are you reading there? Can I help you understand it?" Let me. I mean, but having that, the Lord is calling us. The Lord's calling us to do stuff. Uh, and I just love how Philip just doesn't even think twice. Okay, I'm going to go talk to this guy. I don't know why I'm talking to him. So, so. Uh... Jimmy Olson uh, in the studio here um, had invited me to something last week, and it was in order uh, – there was an event going on, and I was receiving a seminarian who was going to be with me for the month, and so I was supposed to take him. And the seminarian didn't show, and so I was disinclined to go to the thing. Like I decided I wasn't going to go. And I'm sitting in the confessional waiting for confessions to end, and I'm dreaming of what I'm going to eat in my house and get to bed early and have a nice night in it. And, and something in my gut just said, go to the event anyway. And – Jimmy introduced me to three of his friends, and it wasn't until halfway through the night that I realized I was sitting with three Protestant ministers. Oh, Oh. worse than Ethiopians, they're Protestants. (laughs) And and (laughs) and it was it was the finest witness to Christ that I've had in ages. They 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 touched me deeply. I I I was moved and drawn, and they actually provided me with my homily for the weekend. There you go. So, so I, I, being open to those promptings of the Spirit is, I, I think, one of the most essential components of being a Christian. And I think when I read that story, it helps to reinvigorate me to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's easy to close ourselves off after, you know, we get comfortable. Like, for example, you had dreamt of, like, literally, I want to just eat something and go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to get comfortable um, when the Lord is not necessarily calling us to be comfortable. comfortable. Calling, to, get out of our, to get out of our comfort zone. Um, and I, the story of St. Philip, very short story in the middle of Acts there. Uh, but it's a really great story. The, the way the early church, the reason it grew at four hundred percent every year for three hundred years, is because of stories like that of people, mm-hmm. you know, not caring what other people think and being happy to. Uh, and also in the words of Saint Peter, they were they had a defense of their faith, always ready. Um, anyway, I, I that 
obviously one of my favorite stories in, uh, of the Book of Acts. Uh, you mentioned other, so we got uh, four minutes left. Other ones you want to mention? Things that you uh, guys from the old well, New Testament. I mean, you know, what, what I close out on that is simply to say with Saint John, like the Saint John, the the apostle and evangelist. You know, the the what he what he really brings to the story, which is in some ways, I think, the great insight of the whole of the New Testament, like taken as as a whole, is. You, heaven and earth have come together in a way that was unknown and unimaginable before. So that in the, in the prologue, right in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God and the word became flesh. And then in the, in the, the prologue to, to the epistle, what we have seen with our eyes touched with our hands, that which we have handed on to you, the word of life. So that literally the word, which became flesh has been handed on to us, and that we literally hand on in the sacraments, in uh, in the preaching, and the and the the life of the church, and especially the life of grace is practiced, you know, in 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 virtue and, and prayer. So, um, so the, the, really, it, it kind of um, encapsulates the the whole thing. That, of course, gets uh, revealed in different ways with other other sort of um, you know, uh, notable mentions. You know, people like uh, Nicodemus, who was brave enough to, to to speak to the Lord at night, even though he was unsure of what it meant, but who was willing uh, ultimately to to align himself with 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 the whole community. Joseph of Arimathea, who's silent through the book, but then winds up the, the only one brave enough to try and claim the body. Mm-hmm. Um, and in a funny sort of way, now this is not canonical, but I th- I think there's wisdom in the early church's um, tradition here. Um, there were stories that circulated in the early church around Pontius Pilate's conversion. And whether it's true or not is sort of not the point. Mm-hmm. The vision was that the early church understood that what had happened in Christ Jesus was so profound that even those who put him to death could be saved by that same death and could share in that resurrection. Yeah, I don't have that in my Bible. It's that's, not in that's there. That's missing in it's, my New it's Testament. It's not in there. It's in the Acts of Pilate and the Gospel of Nicodemus, which are Have you read both? Have books. you read those? Mm-hmm. You're the mm-hmm. best. This is, why, this is why I need you on every episode. This is incredible. <laughs> um, other books that I would I have to mention, um, the book of St. James. It's probably my favorite book of the Bible because it's only five chapters and it just hits you in the face. Every line of it. Uh, for, for, for Advent this year, my men's group, we read it every week. So a chapter mm-hmm. a day, and then he's re- reread it every single week. And I mean, it's just so pithy, but it's so direct, especially for men. Mm-hmm. Um, so the book of St. James is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful book, a book. And then there's a lot of much smaller books, books in John, Jude. Um, I have made the pitch many times to my listeners. Hopefully they have taken me seriously on it. I have right in front of me here the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible New Testament. It's a leather-bound version. It's like 35 bucks, but it's the one with all of Scott Hahn's notes. Mm-hmm. So when I read through the, old te- or the New Testament, this is what I, I use. So I've read through the entire thing with all the notes. And I mean, even to the beginning when we're talking about why was this book read, who was it, when was it, all that stuff's in here. So get yourself a good study Bible. Um, it's imperative. Being a Catholic, you should have a really good leather-bound Bible that mm-hmm. you can, like, take with you. You should also have one that you can mess with, like write notes right in, in all over the place. Right. And then, you know, good study Bible with notes. All these things are helpful uh, as we're thinking about, again, trying to be biblically minded men uh, and learn from it. Uh, other final people that we need to mention, other last men of the Bible before we close this thing out. Uh, Jesus? So I feel like <laughs> Jesus needs an entire series on him, um, but you would we would be remiss, I suppose, if we left him out completely. I think, you know, I, I, I think to simply <laughs> carry on what you've... Um, what, what what you said, Joe? You, you know, the Holy Father has actually introduced a new uh, a new observance, a new feast in the in the church year this year, and and we'll be able to celebrate it for the first time in a couple of weeks. So January the twenty sixth, which is the third Sunday of Ordinary Time, will become something like Divine Mercy, which is the second mm-hmm. Sunday of Easter, and it's called the Sunday of the Word of God. And so I I w- would simply encourage this year, especially if you've never done it before, Catholics have a worse reputation than is deserved relative to the Bible, but we aren't as good as we ought to be. Um, just read the damn book. That's a great way to end the series. <laughs> 15 minutes a day, wake up and do it. But again, having a study Bible with notes can help walk you through it. I mean, that's the other thing that's is it. if you're just lo- if you're completely if the Ethiopian eunuch, how can anyone understand this? If right. no one explains it to me, well, luckily we live in 2020. There's a lot of people who have explained it. Father PJ, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, It was a wonderful way to end this, and I'm glad you brought up Jesus of all the great men of the Bible. (laughs) So we're going to head to a short break. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Why do folks give to the Catholic tuition organization? Probably because they love Catholic schools, right? Partially, but they also like the tax benefits, or they were helped when their kids were in school, or they have been blessed and want to bless others. Whatever the reason, the 65% tax credits are great, and after all, it's for the kids and their future. Online, ctoiowa.org. Support for Dowling Catholic Sports 365 is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic with two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling Catholic graduate, and Dr. Todd Pedig. The Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at Ashworth and 60th Street in West Des Moines, 515-440-4610, online at ashworthvision.com. My help comes from you. You're right here pulling me through. You carry my weakness. Welcome back to Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. My thanks again to Father PJ. I believe he joined me three or four times uh, during the course of this year. Uh, always a great interview with him. Uh, and I thank you, the listeners, for joining me for this year uh, in walking through the Bible. Couple events to to bring your attention to. Really excited about both of them. Uh, the first one is an evening, a men's uh, man up evening on the twenty eighth, Tuesday, the twenty eighth of January at St. Mary's uh, in Johnston. Uh, Tom Coiner and Tim Jamison are going to discuss their missions to evangelize in a divided culture. Both of those men, great men. I'm good friends with both of them, and their message will be awesome. So make sure you're there on the twenty eighth. Uh, I believe those usually start at 5.45, or five, Rosers at 5.20 and 5.45 for Mass. And then the Iowa Catholic Men's Conference. Please mark your calendars. I'm going to say it every week from now on. Uh, 22nd of February, Saturday, the 22nd, the Saturday before Lent starts, uh, downtown at the Embassy Suites. Mass starts at 7.30 in the morning. Matt Campbell will be your keynote speaker. Iowa head football coach, Iowa State head football coach, Matt Campbell. Uh, I will do a talk as well. I've given a few keynotes to men's groups. I'm really excited about this opportunity uh, here in Des Moines. And then it will be emceed by John Leonetti. And we're, we're just so confident that you will be the, we will reach audiences we've never reached before uh, with Matt Campbell being there, with movie at the NBC Suites. We've shortened it to a morning only. No excuse not to come. It's only $20, and I know the content is going to be wonderful. Uh, we're just we're so excited to see what we can do to start a men's movement, really launch a movement uh, for men here in the local central Iowa area. Uh, and I really want you to join me, uh, John Leonetti, Matt Campbell, uh, and hopefully a thousand other men on February 22nd. Thanks again for joining me on Man Up. I am Joe Stopulus, and it's time to Man Up. Man Up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulus. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.